In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for our new Pope, Pope Francis. And um, never have I taught a class in which uh, there were two popes reigning, and that's really special. <laughs> um, so we pray for him, and we ask that he, you give him great graces as he leads the church in, in humility and wisdom, and uh, to be able to take us here deep into the 21st century to, to spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so we ask also blessings upon us, this class, as we conclude our Bible study this morning on the Paschal Mysteries of our Lord. And uh, we ask that you make Holy Week much more rich, um, much more meaningful and touching in our lives as we advance towards holiness in our own ways. And as always, we dedicate our study to Our Lady as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All righty. So, lesson four, the Paschal Mysteries. Okay, and that includes, well, in fact, let me just share here what that includes. Number one, I, I, I always like to introduce um, the lesson, and I want to talk about did Jesus have to die? Why did Jesus have to die? Was it necessary for him to be crucified? Those are very, very important questions for us to ask because sometimes, you know, it's, it's very, um, it's almost scandalous, right? The father giving up his son to suffer and to die in this brutal, brutal way. Well, why? And I want to talk a little bit about that. Number two, look at Jesus' passion and crucifixion. Then, of course, naturally, the resurrection from the dead. And finally, the ascension into heaven. So, no big surprises, I don't think, here uh, for today's lesson. But there's so much stuff to talk about. Um, as usual, what I want to do is maybe say, uh, I, I actually had to pick maybe one or two little points for each of these sections as we go through them um, and just skip over a whole bunch of stuff because I want to stay focused on what I've been trying to do, the, the, the perspective, the approach I've been trying to do, and that is look at that threefold mystery. So again, there's a whole lot to, to see and to say and to talk about. Um, don't get upset if uh, I don't say something that you're hoping to hear about, but maybe during the Q&A we could bring that up, okay? So there's plenty of opportunities to share some, some wonderful insights. Uh, but just to have an opening paragraph here, an open quote, opening quotation from the Catechism, it says, the Paschal mystery of Christ's cross and resurrection stands at the center of the good news of the apostles. It is the very center of the gospel, okay? The good news is that the apostles and the church following them are to proclaim to the world. God's saving plan was accomplished once and for all by the redemptive death of his son, Jesus Christ. So this is really, I mean, in the, in the life of Christ, this is the hour for which he came. You remember the gospel, was saying, my hour has not yet come. And then finally, when the hour has come, he said, my hour has arrived. You know, it's not actually a literal hour. It's, you know, uh, it's a, a phrase and expression to refer to his time, the moment moment that he, the, the purpose for which he became incarnate, the purpose for which he had this, you know, er, everything in his infancy and hidden life, his public life, leading up to this moment, the ultimate act of redemption, all right, salvation for us. So this is, this is what we believe as Christians. This is the center of it all. If this falls flat on its face, then we, we should pack it up and go home, really. Should find another job, you know, right? You know, maybe I'll become a lawyer, uh, that'd be nice, uh, or doctor or something like that, because honestly, what are we doing here if this isn't true? So, all right. Having said that, let's dive on in. Why was Jesus crucified? Let's just say a few things about this and make sure we understand clearly in our heads a few very important points. Why was Jesus killed? Okay, why was he crucified? And there are various reasons for this. First of all, historical reasons why Jesus had conflict with the leaders of, of first century uh, Jerusalem. Okay, The first was his authority over the law. Jesus didn't abolish the law. He fulfilled it. And in his fulfilling of the law, he says this very clearly in Matthew 5, 17. He came to fulfill it, the law and the prophets. He, they spoke Christ. They prophesied Christ. And he was going to fulfill it, meaning he has authority over the law because essentially he is the the divine author of the law and this he says many times on the sermon on the mount you have heard that it was said but i say to you and the sermon on the mount are called the antitheses okay you have heard that it said but that's the anti part not and you know, the reversal antitheses but i say to you okay he's got that authority how dare he do that right this is moses we're talking about and here he says i say to you 
He's elevating the law. He's perfecting the law from its weakness under Moses. And he's elevating it because he's going to provide the grace to, to, to live the law. So there's that. There's also various instances where he overturned some of the human traditions given by the Pharisees, the Pharisaic traditions. Why do you transgress the law for your traditions, he says here in Matthew 15. Not that he condemns all human traditions, by the way, but these particular traditions that they had really contradicted the law of Moses. So you can see his attitude... About the law, his attitude, uh, you know, fulfilling the law, he's the Lord of the law, and, you know, overturning some of their traditions, he's not going to make any friends. This is not a way to win friends and influence people, right? <laughs> Have you read that book? It's actually a good book. We should, we should probably all read it once a year, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking about myself, first and foremost. But in any case, so his issues, uh, his authority over the law. Also, his authority over the temple. What was the most sacred place in all of Judaism and in Jerusalem and the promised land? The temple. It's where God dwelt. But he had authority over the temple. Remember when he cleaned house? I love that there's, I probably... I couldn't have put it up here, I suppose not, but there's a great little poster. It says, WWJD, right? What would Jesus do? Grab a whip and clean house. (laughs) Considering we have a new pope, maybe we should tweet him. That'd be great. Have you seen this poster, (laughs) your holiness? No, anyways, I don't want to get in trouble. It's day one on the job and look at me. Anyways, that cleansing of the temple. I mean, that was a big deal. They asked, by what authority do you do this? Okay, and then the other thing is, he says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. Of course, pointing to the fact that he's the temple. The temple made of bricks and mortar is a sign, a type, a prefigurement of who he is in his humanity. So that's important as well. Also, number three, all of his claims to divinity. Now, we saw in the very first lesson, for those of you who are with us, it's also on the website. We spent an entire class looking at all the ways he claimed divinity. But I just want to point out two scripture passages by way of um, of a reminder. Why they rejected him, why they killed him. John 5, 18, for this reason the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, of course we could have added that, right, to the catechism, he claims to be Lord of the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his own father, thereby making himself equal to God. And that... It irritated them to the nth degree. For, for a first century Jew, no one's equal to God, and here he is claiming to be God's son. One more quick passage from John 19. Jesus answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, uh, the Jews answered him, pardon me, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the son of God. All right, just two quick, this is, of course, at his trial in John chapter 19, but he claimed to be divine, and you can go back to let the notes for lesson one to see all the instances of, the, of why that's the case, but he was not making friends and influencing people, and obviously he was in many cases, but for the Jewish leaders, because of his authority over the law, over the temple, and his claims to divinity, he had to die. At least historically speaking, the Jews had to kill him because he was blaspheming. Now, Let's take a moment and look at a next very important point, more spiritually uh, speaking, the mystery of redemption, okay? Looking at why, why we needed to be redeemed by Christ, why he had to take flesh and why he, in a certain sense, uh, had to die. We'll explain that in a moment. How, and this is the key, the, the key is sin, Right? Oh, here's the Catholic Church talking about sin again, ad nauseum. But, but it's important, right? Anybody who's honest with themselves knows that they're a sinner. Is anyone here a sinner? Please raise your hand. Come on now. Come on. All right. Let's go. We're, yeah, we're in this together. We really are. All right. So we, are, so we have sinned, and we sinned against each other. And not, you know, I haven't sinned against any of you here, I don't think. But if I do sin, I sin not only against you, but ultimately against God, right? All of our sins are ultimately a sin against God. So our sins demand an infinite atonement. We, that atonement has to be infinite. Why? Because we have sinned against an infinite God. Do you follow that? All right, if I sin against Anne here in the front row, I, she is finite, Right? I mean, I mean no offense. You're finite. I'm finite. I can make a certain atonement if I steal your car. All right? I can... And I... What? <laughs> Please do. Huh? What, what do you drive, by the way? Let's just make sure. The one that has rust. Oh. Let's pick another car to steal. <laughs> All right. So if I steal someone's car and I crash it, well, I could, you know... By the way, it's going to be 
Father A's, yeah, Father A's got a new car. I can steal that one. If I crash it, I can always repay it, right? There's, you know, I can make atonement for an infinite uh, sin. And that's a very simple example, of course. But against God, nothing I do could, could be atoned. I, I can't atone for it because human beings are finite. And how can a finite human being offer infinite atonement? That's very clear, is it not? So how are we going to have an infinite atonement? Well, this is, this is the key. Jesus Christ, who became man, he has got true God and true man in the incarnation. He offers himself as man and God as the perfect sacrifice to atone for our infinite guilt. That's why it's so important that Christ became man. Because he bridges the gap between our infinite guilt and our complete inability to atone for our sin. And not only does he forgive us our sin, but through the incarnation, and ultimately the Paschal mystery as well in his incarnation, he's able to give us back that divine sonship that I'm always talking about, that the scripture always talks about. We, there's, even if we were completely sinless in every way, how can we become divine? There's nothing that you can do to, to divinize yourself, and I mean divinize in a participatory way, okay? There's nothing that we could do. Christ, in his incarnation, offers us that chance at part, being partakers of the divine nature. So that's very important when we look at this, this mystery of redemption as we move into the, uh, the crucifixion and, and, and the Paschal Mysteries. But our next question is, all right, fine. Did Jesus have to be crucified, though? Because he could have redeemed us in... Anyway, right? So the answer to this question strictly, well, it's kind of like yes and no, right? No, he did not have to die on the cross, strictly speaking. God being God, he could have redeemed us in any way he wanted. Amen? He could have said, the divine fiat, your sins are forgiven. Just like that. In fact, this is part of a a theology um, that uh, some Protestant denominations have. Just like, boom, it's it's a declaration, all right? Your sins are forgiven. It's a little more complicated than that. I want to simplify that Protestant theology, but he could have done that. He could have shed one drop of blood. You know, there he is, probably as a young man, hit his hammer. Hit his hammer. (laughs) Hit his nail with a hammer, and not the right kind of nail, you know, the thumbnail. (laughs) All right, and boom, there's some blood. He redeemed us. I mean, whatever. And he could have redeemed this in any other way, in any way he saw fit. But the way he saw fit was through the crucifixion. It's not strictly necessary, absolutely necessary. That's true. We have to remember that. However, it is the most suitable way. It's the most fitting way to redeem us. There's an argument of fittingness to, to what I'm trying to explain, and there are. Pardon me, there are various ways to look at this. Number one, it's the greatest sign of God's love. Amen? It is the absolute greatest sign of God's love. And it sh- it, we can look at a cross, a crucifixion, a, cru- a, a crucifix, and we can see that visible sign of God's love for each and every one of us. And it compels us, it invites us to love Him back. So if you've got God saying, all right, you're forgiven, boom, you're done. On the one hand, and on the other hand, the crucifixion, which one are we going to respond to in gratitude and love and, and, and thanksgiving? The crucifixion. It is a, it's a visible sign of God's infinite love for us to give his son and, of course, for the son to give himself. And it calls us to love him back. Also, it's a public sign of his victory over death. Could Jesus have lived a nice, long uh, life? and died happily in his bed, presumably like St. Joseph did? Would that have redeemed us? Could have, absolutely. But this is a public sign of victory over death. He was there, he suffered an excruciating death, and then he conquered death through the resurrection, and it's public, it's visible for everybody to see. And that's much more powerful and moving than just dying peacefully in your bed. You see that? That public sign of victory over death. Number three, and this is also really trying, it's, a, it's an example of obedience and humility for us. Because Jesus says, unless you take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me. You won't receive, you know, you won't enter into the kingdom of God. We have to take our crosses as well. And of course, as we've heard many times, there are various kinds of crosses. Not one of our crosses are the same. We're all, we've all got them. Who here has a cross? Raise your hand. Come on now. Here we go. Yeah, we all have a cross. So we are able to follow our master because he took his cross. And so we're able to follow in his stead. Does that make sense? 
there's a lot more we can say about this, um, but I just wanted to introduce these three basic points about why the crucifixion is, while not strictly necessary, it is the most suitable way for, for God to redeem us, to forgive us our sins, and unite us into his divine nature. Number one, it's the greatest sign of God's love. Number two, it's a public sign of victory over death. And number three, it teaches us, it's a sign, it's an image of, um, it's an example of obedience and humility. All right? So, one more point before we actually get into the passion and, and, and the trial and the Last Supper and all that stuff. This was a completely voluntary self-sacrifice. This is really troubling for some people. All right? In every denomination, to sort of this image of the cruel God who gives up his son to suffer this excruciating pain. It's kind of like vindictive almost. Like all the wrath that God has, he throws on to his son. And what we forget is that this is a complete self-sacrifice of Christ as well. While he is obedient to the Father, certainly in his human will, his humanity, also in his divine will naturally. The divine will isn't, uh, isn't opposed to one another. The Father's will and the Son's will is not opposed to each other. But this is a, a voluntary self-sacrifice. Jesus did this willingly for love of us. Okay, and that's important to remember. So, uh, a nice, a beautiful quotation here from the Catechism, paragraph 609, says this. By embracing in his human heart, that's beautiful, the sacred heart of Jesus, right? Every household should have an image of the sacred heart. Every household should be consecrated to the sacred heart of Christ. By embracing in his human heart the Father's love for men, Jesus loved them till the end. For greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Again, it's, it's public, it's visible. If he died a peaceful death as an old man in his bed, well, that's good, but no greater love um, has, has a man than this to lay down his life for his friends. In suffering and death, his humanity became the free and perfect instrument of his divine love, which desires the salvation of men. And that goes back to what I was saying before. As fully human and fully divine, true man and true God, he's able to offer up the humanity which has been divinized through the Incarnation, up to God as the perfect sacrifice to redeem us. It goes on, it says, Indeed, out of love for his Father and for men, whom the Father wants to save, Jesus freely accepted his passion and death. No one takes my life from me, he says. I lay it down of my own accord. No one takes his life from him. He lays it down completely freely. Freely. Hence, the sovereign freedom of God's Son as he went out to his death. So we can't forget that very important point. It's not just the Father demanding of the Son, do this. It is of the, it is of the, the perfect free will of the Son in conformity and in love of the Father and for humanity, for human beings, that he offers his life. And we, this goes back to, of course, Abraham and Isaac. Now again, we see Abraham... Okay, i got to sacrifice my only son. Obviously, it was a test. We know how the story ends. I don't want to spoil this for anybody, right? <laughs> you know how this ends, all right? He's going to offer up his son. But what we don't realize is that Isaac freely cooperated with the father, with his father Abraham. And how is this so? Well, a lot of people think he's like a six-year-old, a seven-year-old. He's not. He's probably a teenager, all right, a hardy, strapping young boy, strong. He, how, why do we know this? Because who was the one who carried up the wood of the sacrifice up the mountain on his back? Isaac did. No six-year-old can do that. So he's carrying up the wood of the cross on his back. Or sorry, the wood of the sacrifice on his back. Does that ring anybody's ring any bells? Okay. So he goes up the mountain carrying the wood on his back, and he's a strapping young boy. He asks, you know, Father, where, where's the lamb? Okay, then Abraham says, the Lord will himself provide the lamb, or the Lord will provide himself as the lamb. It's a nuance there in the Hebrew, which is very obvious to us, to our Catholic ears. But in the end, he gets up to the top of the mountain, and uh, Isaac, could, and by the way, how old is Abraham at this point? Roughly 115, give or take a few years. If Isaac was a strapping young man, and his father, Abraham, is roughly 115 years old. If Isaac didn't want to be sacrificed, don't you think he could have just elbowed his dad in the ribs and gone down that mountain? Abraham wouldn't follow. 
too quickly. Okay, So there are so many th- more things we could say about that, but the point is, Abraham and his son Isaac obviously is a type of God the Father and his, his son Jesus Christ. But in Isaac, we have a voluntary sacrifice. That's why I love this image. Look at his face. Look at Isaac's face. Is that one of terror and fear and disobedience? No, that's one of, okay, well, I was about to die, but thank God this angel showed up. <laughs> right? Right? He's, he's cooperating. He is cooperating. And, and so, therefore, when Jesus becomes a new Isaac later on, he's cooperating with his father's will. Do you follow? So, let's not forget that. So, there are my introductory points that I, in my typical quick fashion, have shared with you. All right? Why Jesus had to die. Of course, um, how we needed to be redeemed. Did he have to strictly be crucified? And finally, his voluntary self-sacrifice. Now let's dive into part two, the passion and the crucifixion. And I want to jump into the Last Supper. And I want to share a few things about this. Um, And again, I had to squish this because um, there's just so much great stuff uh, to share about the Last Supper. But this is what I want to share with you. Number one. The Last Supper is part of the sacrifice. They're not two separate mysteries. I mean, you could look at them as two separate mysteries. But really, the sacrifice of Christ as the Lamb of God is part of the Last Supper meal, the Passover meal. All right, and this is best understood in terms of the four cups. I've, I've taught this before. I hardly recommend, if you think this is fascinating and you want to go into more depth, I recommend Dr. Scott Hahn. He's got a great CD and article online you can find, as well as Dr. Brant Petrie. Some great stuff. I mean, it's not like I found out of this on my own. I mean, I certainly stole this from somebody. A couple people. So, and I want to explain this very briefly, very succinctly, just to show you how the Last Supper is connected with the Passover. So everything, sorry, the, the passion of Christ, the trial, the crucifixion of Christ as the Lamb of God. So everything I'm going to say in this entire lesson, really, from, from here on in, is connected to the fact that the, 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 well, the sacrifice at the Last Supper is the same sacrifice on the cross. Does that make sense? All right, let me show you how this works. There are four cups in, in the Passover meal, and we have this to, to, to the current day in the Seder meal, right? Seder means order. Has anybody been to a Seder meal? I'm still trying to get to one. Um, it'll happen eventually. Um, so the Seder meal has four cups, and as I have here on your notes, the four cups are called the first, the cup of sanctification, which the father of the household sanctifies the day, the, the feast day, the cup of proclamation, in which they proclaim the glorious events of the Exodus and the Passover and all that, the cup of blessing is number three, and finally the fourth cup that concludes the Passover meal is the cup of praise, praising God, they sing hymns, they sing um, the, the Hallel Psalms uh, in, in the book of Psalms, um, but that's basically the structure, right? You've got sanctification, proclamation, blessing, and praise. You follow so far? Now, when we get to the Last Supper in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 and following, we see, and I've got the bullet points here for you in the notes because we don't have time to go and read it verse by verse, but I think you can follow uh, quite easily. At the Last Supper, during the meal, of course... Jesus focuses on his own body. The lamb is never mentioned anywhere in any of the Gospels or in Paul and Corinthians when he talks about the Last Supper. The lamb's not there. Why do you think that's the case? Who is the true lamb of God? Christ is, of course, right? So during the meal, he focuses on his own body, his own flesh, because he's the true lamb of God. Then he takes the cup of blessing. When he says, this is my blood, right? This, the, the moment of consecration. We know that's the third cup because St. Paul says it's the third cup in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I got the reference there for you. So he takes, so they, they eat. He says, this is my body. All right, that's when they would have ate the lamb. But instead of eating the lamb, they eat, of course, the Eucharist. Then he takes that third cup, the cup of blessing. And he says, this is my blood. All right, And it's his own blood because that particular cup of blessing is associated with the promise of redemption. And that makes sense. Why? Because we have redemption through the blood of the Lamb, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now remember, in the, in the original Passover meal, you had to eat the Lamb. That's very important for us Catholics and, well, for anybody who's interested in the truth. You have to eat the Lamb to, be, to partake in the Passover, to have redemption. So he takes this third cup, and they drink of it. Then, all of a sudden, he says he's not going to drink of, uh, of the cup again. He's not going to drink the wine again until he's in his father's kingdom. Do you remember this line? All right. I will not drink of the wine again until I'm in my father's kingdom. And then they take off. 
They leave. They sing some of those Hallel Psalms, and they leave. He doesn't drink that final fourth cup of praise. In other words, the Passover meal is incomplete. It hasn't, it's not done yet. You've got to drink that fourth cup. Then when he gets into the garden, what does he pray three times? Lord, let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me three times. Of course, that's referring to the fourth cup. All right. Then on the way to the cross, on the way to Calvary in Matthew 27, it tells us he refused to drink wine. Because he said he will not drink wine until he's in his father's kingdom, until he accomplishes the kingdom. But John tells us in John 19, when he's on the cross, when he's about to die, he says the words, I thirst. He asks for wine while he's on the cross, after his crucifixion is complete and he's about to die. He drinks the wine and then he utters the words, it is finished. What does the it refer to? The the Passover meal. It does not refer to the redemption because he hasn't been resurrected yet. And the resurrection is, is part of the Paschal Mysteries. So the it is finished refers to the Passover meal because he drank that wine again. And before I told you, the accomplishment of the kingdom is, guess where? On the cross. Jesus redeems the kingdom. He reestablishes the kingdom starting with the, with the cross. And that's why he drinks the wine on the cross, because he's, he's accomplishing the kingdom. So he says, it is finished. The It is the fourth cup. And so therefore we see the Passover meal finishing at his death. It begins in the upper room. You've got the sac- where, Where's the sacrifice of the lamb, pray tell? There's no lamb at the Last Supper. The sacrifice on the lamb is on the cross. So the Eucharist is connected with his sacrifice, and they're one in the same liturgy. Does that make sense, everybody? You all follow? That was the fastest I've ever taught that. (laughs) All right? But you follow follow that, right? So fantastic. So that's what the Last Supper is all about. The, The Last Supper is connected with the passion, the death, the crucifixion of our Lord, and ultimately, we can say with the resurrection as well, because they're all part of the same, um, the mysteries of redemption. So if we want to go ahead now, oh, I should say one more quick thing here. In um, the Last Supper, right, as well as connected to the cross, which we're going to see, Jesus offers himself as priest and victim. Jesus offers himself up as the Lamb of God. That's important. He's the priest and the victim. Why? Because he gives himself up willingly for our sakes. No one takes his life from him. He gives it of his own accord, right? So let's go and look quickly at the threefold mystery. And the threefold revelation, first, a revelation of God, of who Jesus is. What do we see? Well, first, we see that he's God's suffering servant. And I mention this very simply because pretty much we're going to see this in every single mystery, right? The passion, the crucifixion. He is God's suffering servant. And I'm going to read a passage uh, from uh, Isaiah 53 in just a little bit. But we also see God's complete humility. Kenosis is the Greek word. His self-emptying, his self-abasement. He empties himself out completely to give himself to us. Again, as, as a role model, it's the most fitting way to redeem us for so many ways that we saw before. So his complete and total humility. God is not a tyrant. God is a loving father who, who loves us in every way, so much so to give his son for us. In the mystery of redemption, already a lot of this I think is going to be very self-explanatory, very obvious. Number one, his blood is poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. Every other mystery of redemption, starting in the infancy to the public life, leads up to this moment. His blood is poured out for us. Also, we see in communion... His sacrifice is not an external event that we see from the outside. His sacrifice is something that we're called to have communion with. We're called into this communion. Why? Because communion at the banquet table, receiving the the precious body and blood, is a foretaste of what? Heaven. Right? In the book of Revelation, no S, by the way, Revelation. (laughs) There, uh, what is the climax? What is the description of heaven? The great wedding feast of the Lamb. So, the Eucharist here is a participation, a foreshadowing of the heavenly banquet. And that's what we're called to be redeemed for, to to, to feast and to celebrate with our God. 
In terms of the mystery of recapitulation, again, this is, I think, uh, pretty clear. He's the new Passover lamb, right? So the whole Passover lamb, starting in Exodus, and every single year from that point on, he is the true definitive Passover lamb, celebrating the new true definitive Passover. What is the new Passover? The Mass. The Mass is the new Passover, okay, in which we pass from sin, slavery to sin, into new life, and ultimately that will be accomplished when we die then we will, we will participate, we will complete the Passover uh, of Christ. Number two, this means he's a new Moses, right? The old Moses, all right, Moses 1.0, now he's the Moses 2.0. <laughs> okay, he's the new Moses offering the new bread from heaven, not like the manna which perished, but the, the, the new manna, the bread of life, Moses, uh, the new Moses 2.0 gives to us, for a new exodus. Again, passing from death to life. And a lot of these themes I've shared in pretty much every class because this is the, this is the, the, the nutshell, the kernel of what salvation is all about. And this is what it accomplishes right here in the Last Supper. Bam, just like that. It's pretty powerful, right? Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Well, let's now dive in and look at some of the, some little bit of some details in the passion and the trial of our Lord. Okay, the passion, of course, starting with the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, there's a lot that I could say here, naturally, so I'm only going to pick a couple of things uh, for the, the passion, the trial, and the crucifixion. Here, what I wanted to talk about is Jesus' humanity. Jesus is divine, no doubt about it. He's the Son of God. But here we see, in the Garden of Gethsemane, a real, natural, normal, human a, aversion to suffering and death. Right? Because he's human. He's got a true human nature. So he has to submit that true human nature to the divine will. And that's what he's struggling with here in the garden. Lord, let this cup pass from me. That's a very human thing to say. Who here wants to fling themselves headlong to excruciating death? Raise your hand. Right? No one wants to do that. It's natural to preserve our life. So Jesus prays for that, but he says, not my will, Lord, but your will. So when we meditate, especially coming up with uh, Holy Week, or it's right around the corner, when we look at this, we have to remember he willingly suffered for us. So when our sufferings come along, we can unite our sufferings to his. We truly can run to Christ because he has suffered all things for us. He knows what we're going through, in other words. And I think it's very, very important to remember, not to forget that point. Now, in the passion and the trial, again, as I keep saying, it's just like, it's heartbreaking. I wish we had like four hours together. Um, but there's the, the passion in the garden. There's the trial, right, when Jesus is marched back and forth from, you know, the, the Sanhedrin and uh, Herod and, and Pontius Pilate. And there's so much to say, like, what is truth comes to mind. Like that whole fact, how we could apply Pontius Pilate's, you know, he, by the way, he's the patron saint of relativism, right? If, we, if, there ever, if there ever were a patron saint of relativism, Pontius Pilate, well, what is truth, all right? What is truth, all right? But now Pontius Pilate is immortalized as the one who crucified Christ. But in any case, there's a lot we can say, and I want to just jump right on into this, this threefold revelation, okay, and explain some of the details of the, of the passion and the trial while we look at this threefold revelation. All right, first... The revelation of God, of who Christ is in his passion and his trial. Number one, as I said before, he's the suffering servant. And it's at this point that um, I want to go back to Isaiah chapter 53 and just read the first eight or nine verses, even seven verses. Um, I don't know, you probably don't have your Bibles. Um, in fact, I don't think you do. Um, but just, just listen quietly and listen how how um, vivid and how clear this prophecy is of Christ's suffering and how Jesus is God's suffering servant, right? So anyways, let, let me read this. Chapter 53, verses 1 and following. Who has believed what we had heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root at a dry ground. He had no form or comeliness that we should look at him, And no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him as stricken, 
struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation who considered that he was cut up out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. Yet they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. And it goes on. I encourage you to read the rest of 53. Powerful. And so just reading this, the first nine verses of Isaiah 53, you can see, hopefully in your mind, everything that Christ endured in the passion, the trial, the spitting, the buffeting, the slapping, the mockery, the scourging, everything. Yet he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and he opened not his mouth. So in, in every way... He is God's suffering servant. He is also the Son of God, as we've seen from the beginning. It's no surprise to us, but he's revealed as the Son of God in the trial foremost, right? When the Sanhedrin says, you know, by the the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And he says, I am. Remember? He is the Son of God who's who's been revealed to us here in in this mystery. He's also... The king of Israel and the king of kings. And we see this in this reading, right? In Isaiah 53. We see it in the mockery. You know, putting the reed in his hand. He's crowned with the thorns. He's got that, that purple cloak laid on his, his bare flesh. <laughs> right, after he's scourged and he's bleeding, what happens if you put a dry cloth on a wound and then rip it off as hard as you can? All right? In the mockery, he is revealed as the king of Israel. The thorns, the reed, the cloak, all these things. Okay? The mystery of redemption? Well, I think that's obvious, right? He's suffering for us. He is on trial for us. He's not guilty of anything. We sure are. But he stands trial in our place. That's not to say that we're not going to stand before the last judgment. We will. But through Christ, we have forgiveness of our sins. So if we are living a Christian life, we have nothing to fear in the last judgment. What about the mystery of recapitulation? Okay. Well, Jesus, first and foremost, fulfills every Old Testament offering, sacrifice. Every Old Testament sin offering, he is the fulfillment of those. God wasn't bloodthirsty. Those sacrifices taught the people of Israel to forsake their idols, which, by the way, in Egypt, they worshipped the animals that they were called to sacrifice. It's not just because God wanted to see a poor sheep get slaughtered or calf or whatever. It's because they used to worship those animals. Okay? But those animals point forward to Christ, and this is especially true at Yom Kippur, right? The Day of Atonement, all right, where the scapegoat takes upon himself. There's a lot we can say about the two different goats, one that's sacrificed, one that goes out into the wilderness. But Jesus is the scapegoat who takes the sins of the people upon himself and is sacrificed. So he fulfills all these sacrifices. But Jesus is also a new Adam. And I think this is so powerful. I love this part here. Jesus is a new Adam who reverses the sin of Adam. He recapitulates, he recaps, he fulfills what Adam was supposed to do but failed. How do we know this? Well, you got the curses from original sin, the thorns, the sweat of the brow, and all these things, right? Death, returning to dust. Jesus takes on the curse of thorns fully on his head in the crown of thorns. Does he not? All right. What about sweat? By the sweat of your brow, you will earn your bread or your toil, right? Does not Jesus sweat so fiercely, so intensely that he sweats blood? By the way, that is an actual, like, that actually can happen to people who are so intense, intensely um, agonizing over something. What happens, apparently, there's a great book I have called A Doctor at Calvary. But Luke was a doctor, by the way, so he, he, he writes these things. And so what happens is the blood capillary, the, the, the blood cells, the blood capillaries rise to your, the pores, and so basically you sweat blood. 
because that blood capillary rises so much from the intensity of the agony, right? Does that make sense? So there he's sweating blood, taking on the full extent of the curse of the sweat of, of, from original, uh, original sin. Jesus, of course, well, in, the, in original sin, thanks to Adam, he goes to the the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he rejects the tree of life and goes to the tree of knowledge of good and evil and brings sin. But what do the early church fathers in Scripture tell us about the cross? What is the cross other than the true tree of life? What is the fruit of the cross but not the Eucharist? Right? So the cross is the true tree of life, sort of fulfilling the old tree of life in the garden. Of course, nakedness, you know, was, was, uh, was an issue <laughs> for Adam, to, to say the least. Jesus suffers naked on the cross, okay? He reverses death. Later, we're going to see through the, uh, through the crucifixion, right? He reopens paradise. He reclaims man from the ground. God says, you are dust, and to dust you will return. Well, ultimately, through the, the death here on the cross and the resurrection, that dust will, become, will form a new resurrection, a glorified body in Jesus Christ. So in all of these ways, Jesus is the new Adam. Do you see all those? All right, good. That's recapitulation. That's, again, as I say before, typology. So that's a threefold revelation for the trial and the, and, and the passion. Let's move on and look at the crucifixion now. All right. A lot we could say, no doubt about it, but I want to focus on one thing, something that a lot of people are confused about. So um, I love this. I love sharing this. I love teaching this. Did God reject Jesus on the cross? Did God abandon Jesus on the cross? Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So, some theologies, Protestant theologies, say that God could, had to turn his face away from Jesus because Jesus was sin. He, he had taken upon himself the sin of mankind, and so he was despised and rejected and abandoned by God the Father. How does that sound to you? Yeah. No. It sounds pretty bad. Why? Because you're Catholic. You've got the sense, it's called the sense of fidelity, uh, the sense of faith, right? Um, but it's wrong. Why is it wrong? What was Jesus doing? How do we understand the the, the, the proclamation on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's really simple if you know scripture. He's quoting Psalm 22. If you were ever to quote a psalm, let me just back up a second. If you were ever to quote a psalm, you would always quote it, you would invoke the entire psalm by quoting the first line of the psalm. So for example, if I were to say, oh say can you see, what comes to mind? Star-spangled banner. So if Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What comes to mind for the Jews? Psalm 22. And what we have here, I just got a couple of verses to, dis- to, to, to share with you what Jesus was telling the Jews who are seeing the crucifixion to remember. So this is a couple of verses here from the first half of Psalm 22. Tell me if this rings a bell for you. Number one. So it goes on. All those, so all who see me mock at me. They make mouths at me. They shake their heads. Commit your cause to the Lord. Let him rescue the one in whom he delights. For dogs are all around me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves. And for my clothing they cast lots. Does this sound like any... Have have we seen this before? All right. Jesus is... (laughs) <laughs> quoting Psalm 22 to them to say this is being fulfilled right before your very eyes. That's all he's doing. And yes, you, you get into some more spiritual interpretation and, you know, what sin is. You know, he, sin is, a, it separate, our own sin separates us from God. God doesn't abandon us. We abandon ourselves. There's a lot, you know, more spiritually minded people could say and reflect on that. But quite simply here, he's quoting Psalm 22. But, The second half of Psalm 22, I don't have this in your notes, but I encourage you to go back and read it. The second half of Psalm 22 is about his victory, his triumph over evil, over evildoers. Who has the last word but the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of David? So they would not only see the first half of Psalm 22 being fulfilled before their eyes and the crucifixion and the mockery and, you know, the casting of lots and all that, but they would also know that Psalm ends on a triumphant note, a victorious note, and that was going to come in the resurrection. Amen? All right. That's why he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So to move on, let's dive right on into the threefold revelation here. Okay. Um, a revelation of God? Simple. He is the Son of God. 
We see this in various places. We've got this, for, for one, the centurion's confession, right? After the crucifixion, after he, he stabs uh, the, the side of our Lord, he, he plunges the, our Lord's heart and blood and water flows out. He says, this truly was the Son of God. We also see this here. Um, in, uh, we all, the second point is that he is the king of kings. Again, in this part, the Inri title. Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The sign is a mockery, of course, of Christ. He's crucified for claiming to be king of the Jews, and that's why Pontius Pilate puts it up there. But that mockery reveals who he is. The people rejected him, rejected him as their king. All right? So, the next point here, he is also the high priest and the victim. And I explained this back when looking at the, at the Passover, right? He is the high priest and the victim. And I have here the linen vestment in John 19.23. We just saw in Psalm 22, they, divide, they, they, they are casting lots for my garments, right? The garment that they're casting lots for is a solid linen tunic, right? The people, the only person who could uh, wear a solid linen tunic was the high priest. It's a liturgical vestment. Okay, woven from a single piece. And so in, um, you go back to the Old Testament to Leviticus, especially Leviticus 16, which is all about Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The high priest wears the linen vestment. So what are they dividing? They're dividing the high priest's clothing. And I think I've told, m- maybe many of you have heard me say this, but who was the one who gave that linen garment, that linen vestment to the high priest? Who wove it? His mother did. So Mary would have woven that linen garment, that linen vestment, and given it to her son, and now it's being divided. It's being, well, not literally, but it's, they're casting lots for it. All right? That's kind of an interesting fact I picked up somewhere. Anyway, so there we have a revelation of God. He's the son of God, he's king of the Jews, and he's high priest, and he's victim. Also, the mystery of redemption. What can we see here? Again, this isn't surprising for us. He's... He's the suffering servant, as we read just moments ago from Isaiah 53. There are, other, there are three other suffering servant songs, but he's the suffering servant. He's, he, his blood is the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God. That's beginning a new exodus that he begun in the Last Supper. And I kind of anticipated this point moments ago. Right? But the, the, his exodus is now complete. Um, next, the opening of heaven, right? What does he say to the thief, the, the thief who stole heaven, as Archbishop Sheen calls him? All right, the good thief, st- his last moment was to steal heaven, all right? Beautiful. He's, he's Irish, he's very poetic. Um, I'm serious, the Irish have some of the best poets in the world. It's true. Anyway, so the opening of heaven. Heaven was closed because of Adam's sin. Now, thanks to the, the, uh, the crucifixion, heaven is opened. Today, this, the, to this day you will be with me in paradise. And the tearing of the temple veil, that's what it refers to. The Holy of Holies is now... It, you have access to the Holy of Holies. And what is heaven other than the Holy of Holies, right? The real hell, Holy of Holies. Now, recapitulation. As I said before, he's a new Isaac, as everything I mentioned before, right? The wood of the cross, the, the wood of the sacrifice on his back, like the sun. But even more than that, this is, I find this, God is amazing. Is he not? He's amazing. Calvary, Mount Calvary, is the exact same mountain where Abraham offered Isaac. Mount Moriah. It's the exact same mountain, the same location. Second Chronicles 3.1 tells us that. It's not only is a new Isaac, but it's the same spot, for goodness sakes. Okay. Number two, he is, of course, the Passover lamb, as we've been talking about. And what's so amazing about this, I took this from Dr. Brant Petrie as well, one of my favorite, favorite professors. He had learned and shared in his, in his um, Christology class that what they did with the, the, when they sacrificed the real Passover lamb, like the real bat, bat lamb, you know, <laughs> what they did is, so presumably John or Peter or both of them, really, they would take the lamb to the temple. And they were sacrificed 250,000 lambs a day at Passover. Okay? So they'd take the lamb. They would sacrifice the lamb. They had a ritual for this. Like, I believe it was a golden bowl. They caught the blood. And they, there was a, actually a stream that came out of the temple. We're going to come back to this in a second. There's a stream that came out of the temple. They would pour the blood. Because where are you going to get rid of all that blood? 250,000 lambs. So they pour the blood into the, into the stream so it would wash away. They would skin the lamb, and they needed to carry it back to wherever they were going to celebrate Passover. Guess how they carried the lamb back? They took a stake, they inserted the stake horizontally wise through the front 
paws, took another stake, put it down the spine, from the, from the head, down the butt. They literally crucified the lamb. So if you can imagine, gee, well, the, the lamb, the little ba, ba, black sheep, taken to the temple, sacrificed, crucified, and Peter and John carrying this crucified lamb back to Jesus. Incredible, right? So he is the true lamb of God who is truly sacrificed for all of us. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Ah, I got tons of Dr. Petrie stuff over here. No one's taking it. There's great stuff. All right, great stuff you can listen to. <laughs> Anyways, um, so he is the Passover lamb. He is the new Adam. We saw he, how he's the new Adam in the Garden of Gethsemane. I didn't even mention that, right? The temptation in the Garden of Eden, and now in the Garden of Gethsemane, he, 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 he conquers the temptation. But even here on the cross, he's a new Adam. How so? Because how did Eve, how was Eve created from Adam? From his rib, from his side. Jesus is the new Adam. How does he, I don't know, give, up, give forth, you can't say birth, or I'm, you know, generate is not even the right word, but how does the bride of Christ, who is the bride of Christ first? The church. Don't you dare say Mary Magdalene. <laughs> Throw you right on out of here. The church is Christ's bride. Christ is not a polygamist, okay? The church is his bride. How is the bride brought forth? On the cross, this from the side, right? When the side is pierced, blood and water comes forth. And the church is generated, so to speak, through the waters of baptism and the blood of the Eucharist. Divine mercy as well, that divine mercy image, exactly. So, as the new Adam, he gives his bride on the cross from his side, from his very side, just like Adam did. Pretty cool, right? Really amazing. Number four, he's also the new temple. How is he the new temple? All right. Um, let me just share one thing here really quickly with you, and that is the piercing of his side. Okay, John 19. What's so interesting, so as we just t- talked about a moment ago, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. Of course, symbolically pointing forward to the birth of the church. But John like gets all like defensive all of, them, all of a sudden here. He says, He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe his testimony is true, and he knows he tells the truth. In other words, I was there, I saw it, you got to believe me. I am an eyewitness. He's an eyewitness to the death of Christ, certainly. Jesus truly died. We'll get to that in the resurrection. This is going to be a longer class, by the way. Get, get, be prepared. Um, Jesus really, truly died. But he's also, what John is telling us is, Jesus is the new temple. Because blood and water poured forth from his side, from his heart. What does John have in mind? He's got in mind Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel has a vision of a new temple, not the temple in Jerusalem, but of a new temple that is yet to be established. And he says he has this vision. He is brought to the entrance of the temple. And there water was flowing from below the threshold of the temple towards the east. And the water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. So, and if you remember, I don't know if you do or not, but if you go and you read the rest of 47, the water gets deeper and deeper and deeper, right? He goes through, he's wading at his ankles, and he goes down to his knees, then his loins, then his chest, and he can't swim anymore. You remember this? This is the new temple that, you know, the waters of life basically for, flow forth from the temple. And on every side of this great big river that he can't swim aside are basically these trees that give forth fruit day and night, season in, season out. Okay? What does Jesus say when he stands up uh, and he says, come, come to me for the, this is I think John chapter 7 if I remember correctly. You're probably wrong about that. Come, come forth. To me, all you who thirst, for I will give rivers of life, or something like that. I'm Catholic. I don't remember my scripture. Um, That was funny. Come on. But you know what I'm talking about? I can look it up in a second. All right. So, of course, Jesus is referring to himself as the temple. Now, go back to what I said to you a moment ago. There is that little river. It's called the Gihon that flows out of the temple. And the the, the priests, when they accepted the blood of the lambs, where did they put the blood? In the water. So literally, what did you have flowing out of the side of the temple in Jerusalem every Passover? Blood and water. So John sees blood and water flow forth from the body of Christ. He's like, dudes, (laughs) this is the new temple. This is Ezekiel 47. The blood and the water is flowing out of Jesus Christ, the true temple. Do you see that? That's cool, right? Am I the only one in here that has goosebumps? 
No, thank God, because that's I, the heat is cranking too. So he is the new temple. Very good. Now, really quickly, because some people were confused about this, I want to talk quickly about the descent into Hades, the descent into hell. Remember? The descent into hell is very confusing for people because, like, what was he doing? All right, why did he need to descend into hell? The problem is, in English, we think of hell as the place of eternal damnation. And that's not where he went. So, here I explained it a little... Um, not in terms of bullet points, but kind of a paragraph form, what was going on. He did go to Hades, okay, uh, but not hell in terms of of damnation, okay? Nor, and, and there's another problem, he wasn't condemned to hell, by the way. He goes down into the realm of the dead, it's called Hades in, in Latin, or Greek as well, uh, kind of the same. Uh, but also in Hebrew, Sheol. Have you heard that word Sheol before? Let's say you mass. That is the realm of the dead. So, there are kind of, it's called Abraham's bosom, it's called Sheol, it's called Hades. But to get more specific, there are probably, as the Jews understood it, three different places. I mean, places is in quotation marks because really there aren't, you know, it's kind of hard when you're talking about. Uh, there's no space, there's no time, but three places in Sheol, in, in Hades. The first is the realm of the damned. That's called Gehenna. You hear that word before? Gehenna. It's a place outside of Jerusalem where it was no, this place right outside of Jerusalem was a valley in which they threw all their trash, all their sewage, and it burned constantly. Never, the fires never went out. It just constantly burned and burned and burned. And that was the image for the first century Jews of the place of the dead, Gehenna. And it is the place of the dead because that's where, in the times of idolatry, they sacrificed children in that valley. So they consigned it to Satan, and they just burned trash and sewage. And it was known as, well, you know, it was the icon, the image for the place of the dead. Now, but there's the place of the righteous, and that is Abraham's bosom, so to speak, okay? Gehenna and Abraham's bosom. Those are two different places. The third place is the pit. Sometimes you're reading in scripture and you see the pit. That is like the deepest, darkest hole in the realm of the dead reserved for Satan and the fallen angels. Okay? So you got it in your head? So like the pit, realm of the dead, Gehenna, realm of the righteous, and that is Abraham's bosom. Now, presumably, there's a lot unknown about this. There's a lot unknown about what happened, but presumably the consensus among the theologians is that Jesus went down to the realm of the righteous, to Abraham's bosom, to redeem the righteous who were, who were waiting for redemption. You can't go straight to heaven because Jesus hadn't suffered and died and, and risen, from, risen from the dead yet. Does that make sense? So he goes down to preach to the spirits in prison, as 1 Peter 3 tells us, to redeem those who are waiting for redemption. He doesn't go to those who are already damned. Now, even in the Old Testament world, God, being the righteous judge, knows those who have rejected him and those who have not. Because we're all born with the Ten Commandments in our souls. It's called natural law. Those people who died, with you know, who have rejected charity essentially in their hearts who had dis especially for the jews who had disobeyed the law they're in the realm of the damned in simple terms but those who died with charity in their hearts who were obedient to natural law went to the realm of the righteous and that's abraham's bosom and so jesus went down to free those who were waiting for him does that make sense does that explain a lot more so then after he rises from the dead he takes in fact Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8 tells us this. He leads a host of captives into heaven. It's beautiful, right? So, a lot more we could say about that, but I wanted to explain his descent into, in, into hell. Hell, in, 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 not, yeah, in quotations. All right. So, haven't lost anyone yet. Let's move on. We've got to look at the resurrection. The resurrection. Wow. I mean, this is, this is it. This is the resurrection right here. It's the crowning, the crowning, um, uh, the crowning truth of our faith. Okay, it is a historical fact seen by eyewitnesses. All right, it's not a resuscitation, right? Where uh, he was brought down from the cross and saw quick CPR and okay, there he is, he's back, everybody. No, the Romans knew how to kill people. If they wanted someone dead, they would be dead. It's not a resuscitation. It's not a revivification, right? 
where Jesus sort of was, was knocked out. He was seeming dead, and then he went into the tomb. He was buried in the tomb, but the damp, moist air, right, and all the ointment brought him back to life. You know, kind of revivified him. He didn't really die. He kind of was revivified. I don't know. It wasn't a revivification. Nor was it a reincarnation. All right? It was none of these things. It was a true, he died. John saw it. Remember, he's like, dudes, I saw it. I was there. I'm telling the truth, I swear. He died, and then he truly rose from the dead. And this is the crux of all Christianity, right? If this isn't true, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then he suffered needlessly. He's not really God. He's not the king of kings. He's not the suffering servant. He's just a dude that died on the cross like hundreds of millions of other people throughout the Roman Empire. Okay? So, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 the whole chapter talks about this, but here this uh, from verses 13 to 19, St. Paul gets a little bit aggressive. Does, Paul gets a bit aggressive from time to time, does he not? Yeah. By the way, my next class is 1 Corinthians starting next month. Um, but in, in, in these verses here, he just really lays it on the line, Paul does. He says, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ. Whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And he's repeating himself. He's like, did you get it, Corinthians? Do I have to repeat myself time? It's like, come on, Paul. If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. They're lost. They're gone forever. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people the most to be pitied. Wow. If Christ has not been raised, you're still in your sins. Those who have died have perished. And we who only hope in Christ while living are the most to be pitied. Because let's, let's face it. If there's no judgment, if there's no resurrection, if the, sort of like nihilism. You know what nihilism is? The belief that there's nothing out there. Just like, poof, that's it. Nothing more. We die and that's it. If that's true, then let's eat, drink, and be merry, as the phrase goes. Right? Why do we need to live by any moral code? Just enjoy your life. Do whatever your body tells you that you, it wants to do. Because there's no hope if there's no resurrection. So the resurrection is the crowning truth. And um, that's really, considering how much we could say it, that's the, that's the point, right, I, that, I, that I really want to drive home. If it is true, and it is, then we have a lot to rejoice in. The, how is this the revelation of God? Well, simply, He's the Lord of life. He is the Lord of life. How is this the mystery of redemption? Well, He's conquered death. He's redeemed us from death and given us that new life. How is this a mystery of recapitulation? Well, he takes all of our deaths. He unites himself to the death of each and every single person in all of human history and unites that death to himself, and we are united in our death to him as well. So when we die, we're not truly alone. We're not truly alone when we die because Christ is there with us in our death. Is that not consoling? Because part of the fear is that when you die, you're all alone. You make that journey by yourself. But if you're a Christian, you're not alone. Okay? So when we die, we fulfill our baptisms. Because remember, in baptism, we participate in the Paschal Mystery of Jesus Christ. But one of these days we'll die and we will fulfill, live within our own flesh, that, that mystery that we once celebrated. Okay, in baptism, we've already died. To our, to our sinful flesh, and then it'll be consummated when we die, literally. Now, how are you doing? We've got one more major mystery. Can you make it? Yeah. The ascension is one of my favorites. The ascension is one of my favorites. What is the ascension? It's kind of like the forgotten mystery. Okay, It is part of the Paschal mystery. The passion, death, resurrection, and the ascension of our Lord, it's all woven together. Okay. First and foremost, <clears throat> it is the entering into the Holy of Holies. Because he's the high priest. And what does the high priest do once a year? He goes into the Holy of Holies after, you know, after he's sacrificed sin. Or made a sacrifice for sin. Jesus made sacrifice for sin in his own body. Now he's going to enter into the heavenly Holy of Holies. Let me explain this with paragraph 662. The lifting up of Jesus on the cross signifies and announces his lifting up by his ascension into heaven. 
and indeed begins it. So the lifting up on the cross is united, it's linked to the lifting up of the ascension. Jesus Christ, the one priest of the new and eternal covenant, entered not into a sanctuary made by hand, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. There Christ permanently exercises his priesthood. He is a priest. He is the high priest. And in heaven, at the right hand of God, the, the, the seated at the right side of God, he exercises his priesthood, for he always lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through him. He is, that's what priests do, right? They make intercession. They are intermediaries between God and men. And Jesus, as the high priest, makes intercession for all of us. Now, what's so interesting, and I'll get to your question, what's so interesting is, remember I was talking about Yom Kippur, right? How the high priest enters into the Holy of Holies. Well, what's so interesting is that Leviticus 16 describes the conditions by which the high priest enters into the Holy of Holies. And what must fill the Holy of Holies as he enters into it? A cloud. When Jesus rises up into heaven, (laughs) ascends into heaven, what surrounds him but a cloud? The Holy Spirit, right? The glory of, of the glory of God. So that high priesthood, the, on Yom Kippur, the sacrificing of the, of the goat, the, the atonement of sins, the entering into the Holy of Holies, that's all part of this redemption, redemptive act of Christ on the cross, in the resurrection, and in the ascension. And remember, here's the fulfillment of my promise last week. Remember I told you how the triumphal entry is a, is a sign of the ascension? Remember that? Who remembers that? couple of people. Well, the triumphal entry is a sign of the ascension because when Jesus enters into Jerusalem, where's the first place he goes? To the temple. So just as he triumphantly enters into heaven, he goes into the temple, the heavenly, the heavenly temple, not made with hands. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Hang on with me. I know we're, we're over, but there's some good stuff still to come. So not only does he enter into the Holy of Holies as the high priest, but he's also inaugurating the kingdom. He has redeemed it, so to speak, through the cross and resurrection, but now he's inaugurating the kingdom by going to the right hand of God. Does that make sense? Let me show you what I mean. So, in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Daniel has this very famous image, or or vision, right? He says, I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. Remember, this is what Jesus quoted to the Sanhedrin before they freaked out. Like, like, ah, I can't believe it. Remember? Because he's quoting this passage to them. I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. Gee, what does that refer to? Okay. And he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. Daniel is seeing the ascension, pure and simple. This isn't a a reference to the end of the world. This is the ascension. All right, 40 days after Jesus tells the Sanhedrin, you're going to see the Son of Man ascending into the clouds of heaven. Again, was the Sanhedrin around to, to, to view this? Not every individual, of course, but that's it was accomplished 40 days later. So what happens with the ascension is Jesus does go up on the clouds of heaven, the glory cloud, presented to God the Father, and he receives dominion and power and kingship that all peoples, nations, and tongues shall serve him. That's what's going on. That is the beginning of the kingdom that we are now in right now. As it's growing with the new Papa, all right? Pope Francis is going to get some time to get used to that, all right? Pope Francis. The kingdom is being exercised by Christ, who is at the right, side, right hand of the Father, interceding on behalf of us, growing his kingdom before it all is accomplished. So here's my last slide here, the threefold mystery. What does this reveal about God? Well, as we saw before, he is the eternal high priest that goes into the inner sanctuary. He is the eternal son of God, as Daniel chapter 7 points out. He is also the eternal king of kings who rules all the world and all of history. How is this a mystery of redemption? Well, this is key. Because after we rise from the dead, we will go into heaven united with Christ. By fact, there is one person who has already anticipated this 
as a, as a model, as a sign for the whole church. Who is that person? Mary, exactly. The assumption. Okay? So, this is the crowning moment of our redemption. It just doesn't stop on the cross and the, re- and the resurrection. It's completed when we enter into the Holy of Holies, united with our Lord. Okay? And how about the, uh, the mystery of recapitulation to finish this? Well, he fulfills the Old Testament high priesthood and the sacrifice of Yom Kippur, as I've been saying all along. Right? That high priest goes into the Holy of Holies. Beautiful. Um, one more thing. This is when he completes uh, the establishment and the inauguration of the kingdom of David and of God. And that, remember, as we saw last week, was the the goal of his public ministry in his life, really. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the kingdom of David. And it's all completed now. It's inaugurated. Now, while he's in heaven, now obviously it's not completed in the sense that at the end of time, that's it. The kingdom's going to be ratified, so to speak, um, once, once he comes again. So this is the moment that we're living in right now. Jesus is the high priest at the right hand of the Father, building the kingdom until the end of time. All right? Now, I want to thank you for participating. All right? I hope you have a fantastic Holy Week. We'll do questions right now. But I hope you have a happy Holy Week and Easter. Hope you've learned some new things throughout these these four weeks. Um, Thank you for your patience for today, but there's just, I, it's really hard on, on, ooh, so much good stuff. But um, why don't we, before we go to small group discussions, open it up to your, your own questions. And Sandy, you had something about the fourth cup?